The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages presents Karwan Sarai Publishers. Subscribe to their four extraordinary magazines, bringing the ancient world to life. Ancient History. Warfare in the Age of Myth and Heroes. Ancient Warfare. Warfare in the Age of Kings and Castles. Medieval Warfare. It's time to play with history. War games, soldiers, and strategy. Karwan Sarai offers print and online issues and subscriptions. If you love history, subscribe today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale. We are joined by PhD student Stephen DeSashen. He's going to be taking us into the obscure study of military and maritime history. And that is the use of naval battering rams in the ancient world. And so without further ado, DeSashin, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Awesome. So first of all, thanks for having me on your show. I, uh, I watch it a lot, so I really appreciate it. And I, I love the work you do. So like you just said, uh, my name is Stephen DeSashin. I am a second year PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Uh, I am in the nautical archaeology program in the Department of Anthropology. So that is a, a very unique department. They're, it's one of the only nautical archaeology programs in the United States and in the world. Uh, my focus is on ancient naval warfare, naval rams, and warships in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, I also study uh, sex and gender in the ancient world as it relates to naval power, the performance of naval spectacles, uh, the presentation of naval artifacts and monuments. So that's another aspect of my studies. Uh, I received my master's in ancient history from the University of South Florida, where I studied with Dr. William M. Murray, who wrote the book, The Age of Titans, which is about Hellenistic naval warfare. So that's how I got into it, right? His obsession with naval rams became, became kind of my obsession with naval rams. So that's the connection there. Uh, I received my BA um, in historical studies from Stockton University. Um, also, I attended the summer session of 2018 at the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. So that's my connection to Dr. Futo Kennedy, who is on your show a lot. So she's an amazing scholar, and I have a lot of respect for her, and I love the stuff she does for your channel. So <laughs> that's, she's, she's, she's awesome. And so let's talk naval battering rams. When it comes to your field of study and focus, when do we first see the appearance of this type of weaponry? on ancient naval battleships. So when we say the word naval ram, we really refer to just as naval rams. So what does that mean? And like, what are we referring to exactly? So in essence, what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, just a weapon, a weapon used in naval warfare, arguably from the classical period to the time of the, you know, later Roman Empire, right? That has a history and development that, spans for probably almost 500 years, right? It's a weapon that's in use for a very long time. So the naval ram was a penetrating weapon, right? It was placed at the bow of a warship near the waterline. Uh, rams were used in both offensive and defensive naval maneuvers to strike or ram other warships to cause damage. Um, that could lead to an enemy ship being sunk, swamped, or utterly destroyed. So your question was, what was the earliest reference we have to these? Uh, we have two early literary references. The two earliest literary references we have to these come in two different Greek sources, right? So the Greek term for the naval ram is embolos, right? Embolos means to throw in or to thrust in, right? So literally to, when you ram somebody, you literally thrust into them, you throw yourself into them. So the earliest reference we have is from, uh, I believe it's Hipponox of Eph Ephesus and uh, the Greek historian Herodotus. And Hipponox provides us with the first mention of also the trireme, which is also interesting, in the same line. And that happens um, in, I believe it's 542 BCE. And Hipponox's uh, description is obscure because he doesn't really tell us anything about the ram itself. He says something like, don't paint. Uh, the triremes benches on one side, uh, a serpent that runs from the ram to the helmsman um, because it's a dangerous omen for the helmsman. 
um, something about a slave born of a slave. Like he's making fun of this guy. Um, and I believe it's like uh, in, in his fragments, I believe it's uh, fragment 28, but then um, sometimes it's referred to as fragment 45. I know there's some kind of confusion, but that's the earliest reference we have to the naval ram, not its use, but its actual reference in the ancient sources. Uh, for its earliest use, Herodotus first mentions it um, in his passage describing the Battle of Aaliyah in 540, uh, 535 BCE. Um, and this is in the battle where there's, I think, 60 Phocian ships engaged in uh, the Sidonian Sea. They engage with the enemy. And the rams are actually not that effective. So it's, it's um, what happens is that when the Phocians engage with the enemy, their rams, I think Herodotus says in the Greek, are actually twisted backwards. So the, the term embolos here, or ram, um, in my opinion, might not actually mean the rams that we think about today in the ancient sources or the rams we have in the archaeological record. Um, there is another scholar, Samuel Mark, who makes the same argument in one of his um, one of his articles where he thinks that the term embolos used in Herodotus here doesn't designate a three bladed waterline ram, which is the rams that I study that are these are the rams that are attested to in the archaeological record. The rams that are talked about in Herodotus in this battle are like a proto ram or one of the first iterations or the first inventions of a type of ram or ramming, I guess, uh, I guess just one of the first iterations of a ram to be used and that their failure rate in this battle is an indication of one of its first early inventions because they were so in effect, right? They were effective, but since Herodotus says that half the ships, they were twisted backwards, right? Rams, if they're effective, not going to twist back. It makes no sense to twist back. Um, but so based on this and the earliest references in the 540s, Samuel Mark ar argued in his article that, you know, truly the, the, the quintessential naval ram that we all talk about, we all see, doesn't come about until uh, probably 480 with the Battle of um, Salamis, uh, Artemisium, right? And that for the uh, mentions of naval rams or anything else are basically what I would argue, and he would argue, probably proto-rams, right? Iterations, inventions leading up to our quintessential three-bladed waterline ram that uh, we see in the archaeological record. So basically, your two earliest mentions are Hipponox and Herodotus. And so we've covered the earliest references to these battering rams. And now let's talk about the evolution of this ram. How does it go from being this ineffective just piece on a ship to being something that we view today as something that a lot of sailors would be terrified of? You know, good question. Of course, you know, weapon development is, you know, it's not linear or constantly progressive, right? In my studies, I found it easiest to study um, ancient weapons by their design changes, right? The shifting tactics and strategies that are employed when using, uh, you know, weapons such as the naval ram. Um, when studying the naval ram, you know, it's, it's, it goes hand in hand with the shipbuilding processes that are involved in antiquity, um, warship capabilities, um, and mainly the tactics in which navies or ancient fleets employ during battles, right? So when I looked at naval rams, the long history of naval rams, and I thought about this question, I thought that, in essence, there are probably five good periods <laughs> that we could break naval ram development into, right? So again, the first period I would say is the proto-ram period, right? That I would say is from 1200 to 480 BCE. So this period is defined by rams that are not necessarily rams. But the first steps that I said to the invention leading to the three-bladed waterline ram. Uh, the three-bladed waterline ram would be like, uh, if we think about rams in real life, we have like the athlete ram, the agate rams, the Piraeus ram, right? Like actual rams that we have in the, in the archaeological record. Um, but the proto-rams would be on ships that are built um, well, there'll be a ship, they'd be small galleys, they'd be ships that are built in the sewn or lace tradition of shipbuilding, which are never effective ramming ships, right? Because those are weak links, right? Something that is sewn, 
right? These the planks would just snap. Um, proto ramps would be like I said, not ramps. They would be more things like reinforced cut waters, uh, pointed extensions of the bow covered in bronze, blunt ended uh, bronze coverings. We th- we see these kinds of things in um, mosaics, early mosaics, and stuff like that. So there is evidence for these things. Um, and this type of period, proto ram period, is not defined by ramming but more of a de- defense of the, uh, the weak structures of the bow and is defined by boarding, right? Boarding tactics, fighting with long spears across ships, bows and arrows and things of that nature, not ramming. But moving forward, so once we get to 480 with the invention um, and the end of uh, effective ramming, we have the maneuvering to ram period is what I call it, right? So from, that's from 480 to 413. And of course, maneuvering to ramming happens after 413, but a new tactic uh, comes about after that. But so the maneuvering to ram period is defined by the invention of the waterline ram, the creation of warships that are built using pegged mortise and tenon joinery, right? This is a very rigid type of mortise and tenon joinery that is used to hold the planks of the warship together. So now they're rigid. And they can actually distribute ramming forces throughout the entirety of the warship, right? So before, when you have these weak um, links in the planking, you couldn't ram a ship with weak links, right? But now you have pegged mortise and tenon joinery. You can hit something, and your ship won't completely obliterate itself. Also, during this period, better casting techniques are invented. Larger, you're you're able to cast larger things. So now you're able to cast actual, you know, fully cast bronze rams in one casting. This period is also defined, like I said, by the tactics itself, you know, maneuvering to ramming, meaning warships perform these complex maneuvers to ram each other. Um, they try to gain position against each other in order to ram them. Uh, this is highlighted by the Athenian Navy, right? So, so in their initial stage uh, in the creation of their empire and during the Peloponnesian War, uh, the Athenians were the best at doing this, right? Maneuvering to ram. So they would perform such maneuvers as, uh, in Greek terms, the uh, diekplus, the periplus, the kiklos, the anastrophe, right? Basically, they would take their trireme or whatever, basically the trireme, and they would try to maneuver around their enemy to try to hit their ram at a vulnerable section of the enemy ship, whether it be the side and the back, but they would never strike in the frontal face, right? You would never have a ship during this period strike another ship at the prow or at the ram. You would always try to avoid and try to, you know, think about like a boxing match. You're trying to get the best advantage. You, you know, you're, you're ducking, you're diving, you're trying to like catch the guy not looking right. You're trying to, you get the best advantage, hit them where they're the weakest. And that's the maneuvering to ramp period. But then moving forward in the, in the third category that I thought about was the frontal ramming and naval siege warfare period from 413 to 31 BCE. This period is wild. This period is defined by the creation of huge, huge ships and huge rams, right? This, uh, this comes about with the creation of, you know, uh, you know, just wild innovations in ship construction, casting, and military equipment. And in this period, ram, uh, rams become so large and ships become so strong that they can now frontally ram each other, right? It's no longer this stylistic moving back and forth. But basically, opponents strike each other face to face or ram to ram or prow to prow. So no longer are we doing this Athenian fancy style back and forth maneuvering. Ships come at each other face to face. I, I, I like think I always think about it in boxing terms where it's like, you know, the period before the, this maneuvering to ram is like Muhammad Ali kind of style. But then we get the frontal ram and this is like Mike Tyson coming at you straight to the face, right? This is, this is that period. So during the frontal ramming period, you know, ships are built heavier overall. The timbers are bigger. The rams are casted bigger. Um, this is this period is the frontal ramming period. Um, the bigger ships, at least, are unique to the Eastern Mediterranean. The Romans don't build bigger ships, right? They don't build anything bigger than what we would call a five or a quincarine. Uh, they do frontally ram. The Romans do participate in maneuvering to ram tactics, right? A lot of people would say you might get some comments if. You know, that, oh, Romans always board. They only board. They only do this and that. But uh, that's not necessarily true. The Romans do participate in frontal ramming. They do uh, do maneuvering to ram. It's just they don't build big ships and they don't participate in that type of warfare. Um, but also during this period, there's uh, 
naval siege warfare, which I'm not going to get into too much of that, but are bigger and stronger to also break harbor defenses because during this period, uh, bigger ships are able to break through um, harbor chains and a lot of naval siege warfare in the east is to take coastal cities, which is another interesting aspect. So the fourth category and fifth category are not as important as the other two, but the fourth category I, I, I kind of made up is prestige rams from 306 to 204. It's within the frontal ramming category, but uh, this period is, is basically defined by rams that are completely useless. Right? These rams are created for the power and prestige of Hellenistic rulers. These, these would be rams built for ships that are built for Demetrius, Ptolemy II, Lysimachus. Right? Just, uh, let's see, for example, uh, the 40 built by Ptolemy IV, the, Ptolemy the, the biggest warship ever built in antiquity. Right? It's, it, it, it was said to have seven naval rams on it. No ship need seven naval rams let's be real it, it it's in the ancient sources we're told that the ship never left the harbor it was highly ineffective it was dangerous to move it was probably a, a catamaran built ship so it had two ships that were lashed together but so these uh, a lot of these prestige ram ships um actually never see battle some of them are built and are seaworthy but uh they're more of a uh i guess intimidation factor right they're they're put out to sea to be like all right look at my large ship Look at this large ram. You're not going to come fight this, are you? Right. So you scare the enemy without fighting. Right. You'd rather not have all your men die. <laughs> and then the fifth category, which leads to the end of the uh, of the naval ram, is I would call the riverine ram period from 31 BC to 100 ACE. And this period is basically defined by the end of the larger frontal ramming vessels, the end of the competition in the Mediterranean in terms of naval forces. Because, you know, basically after 31 BC in the Battle of Actium, the Roman Empire has, you know, uh, a monopoly on sea power in the Mediterranean. And their focus shifts away from the Mediterranean to the rivers of Germany, of Eastern Europe, to other bodies of water across uh, the empire. And since there are no larger navies to compete in the Mediterranean, there is no need for larger ships. There's no need for navies. There's no need for the naval ramp. So basically, without direct competition in the Mediterranean, rams begin to lessen. They don't need them, but there is still a use for them in these small waterways in different parts of Europe. So we do see the creation of these uh, odd naval rams that are not three-bladed waterline rams. But uh, I don't know if scholars are going to agree if they're rams or not. We'll see. They're still for debate. We're finding some interesting things that people are starting to publish about these uh, Roman ships that have these odd rams on them. So we've talked about the origins of the naval ram. We've talked about the development over time. We've talked about how it slowly falls into disuse. And so now I want to talk about the actual object itself. Do we know what kind of materials were typically used to make these? And honestly, do we even know how long it would take to construct something like this? Based on the rams we have, we have... In the archaeological record, I think now 33 to 35 rams, actually, which is actually a, a lot. We have no warships, no full warships from antiquity survive to this day, but we do have the rams. So we have around 35 rams from a variety of periods from uh, uh, 400 to around, uh, let's say, I think 200 BCE. We have a, a few rams, but rams are made, all of them are made from bronze. Of course, um, they all vary in their overall composition, right? We have, um, they all have some amount of copper and tin, right? That makes up bronze. Um, but some of them have traces amount of zinc and the Egedi rams in particular, the ones found at Egedi, which are from the battle in 241 BCE between Rome and Carthage, have a lots, lots, lots amount of lead in them. I think it's like almost between 20 and 30% of lead, which has to do with, uh, something in the casting process. And um, I'm not an expert in metallurgy, um, but it has to do with the, the ductility in the metal. It, it makes it easier to work it. So, but, you know, as evidenced by the Egedi Rams and the Hellenistic athlete Ram, uh, we know the standard way of casting a Ram is through a technique known as lost wax casting, right? Lost wax casting is still performed today, 
Um, the, the methods really hasn't changed in the last few thousand years. But uh, basically, the, the, the casting of a naval ram uh, depended, depended on the way the warship it was to be attached to was constructed because of the complex nature of ship construction at the time. Right, Every warship that was built was unique because every warship was built shell first from the ground up. Right, You start with the keel and you build up around it, and then you build the interior frames. So every warship was unique. Therefore, every ram had to be unique to the ship it was going to be fit onto. Nothing was mass produced for these ships. I mean, except for maybe like braille rings and things like that. But the, the, the naval rams themselves, every single one was unique. So due to this problem, right, once the bow was finished for that particular ship, the craftsman tasked with making the ram would apply pitch to the bow timbers of the ship to compensate for the shrinkage that occurred during the casting process. So once the pitch dried, the craftsman would actually apply olive oil um, to the bow and would then make a one-to-one scale beeswax mold of the ram itself. So all the designs, the whole entire ram would be built in wax onto the ship itself. So, I mean, it's got to be a really, a really fascinating and interesting process to see a ram built in beeswax onto the ship. Um, but after that, you know, they would uh, take the beeswax mold off. They would fill the empty cavity, right? Because you would have an empty cavity by taking it off. They would fill it with refractory clay. Uh, then they would place it into the ground, uh, nose, nose down first, um, into a casting pit. They would melt the wax out from the bottom, right? They would have, we're not really sure how they did this part, but they would probably have a, a complex system of, uh, you know, rods and, and gates and stuff like that to release gases and, and things like that. And then they would pour melting bronze into it, right? And then once it was hardened, right, they would check to see if it was hardened. They would break it open, take it out. They would lift it out of the pit, you know, put it on to, back onto the bow, and then they would spike it onto the ship and sometimes if they're you know if it was too i guess if it was too small the ram was too small if they didn't compensate for the shrinkage we have evidence you know they had to shave down the ship a little bit you know which you don't want to do but they would shave down the ship a little bit and then put it back on and spike it again to see if they can get that and there's there's some articles about this um i think asif Oren talks about this in his athlete ram article but i mean the casting process is something that i'm very very interested in and hopefully Hopefully this summer I'll be able to do a little project here and there working with casting uh, smaller versions of naval rams. We'll see. <laughs> we know what materials were used in it. You've given us an awesome and interesting insight into how they made these. Out of curiosity, do we know how expensive or a guesstimate as to how much these would have cost? We are not really sure how much any ram would have cost to make. I would say it wouldn't have been cheap, but I don't think it would have been as expensive as you think overall. Um, there is one indication. Uh, Dr. William M. Murray talks about the cost of, of some bronze and some rams in his article titled The Way of Trireme Rams, The Price of Bronze in the Fourth Century Athens, where he argues, um, based on epigraphic evidence, that five rams cost 524.5 drachma, I think he says. So, and I think at this point, a skilled laborer in Athens made like two and a half drachma a day. Don't quote me on that. I can't. I don't. I don't. That someone could do the math if they if they watch this video and they comment. They can do the math on that. They cost a pretty penny. Let's say that. <laughs> um, but overall, they're just you know they're one small part. Naval rams are one small part of the overall expenditure for a navy. So I think if we if we think about that, right? So if we're moving into cost and material, you know, just thinking about from the naval ram to, you know, uh, you know fleet expenditures or Navy expenditures, we have to think about the cost in, involved of building ships, right? Because the Naval Ram is just the weapon, right? The ship is the most important thing. So we have to think about, you know, we're building a ship, we have to think about large wood stocks, rope, pitch, the wax for the Ram, copper, tin, iron, right? All this other material for construction and all in significant quantities, right? Because the Athenians, you know, at some point have 200 warships. That's 200 rams. That's 200 warships worth of wood, right? That's all the sails. Um, we have to think about the ship's gear then, right? Oars, mast, yard sails, right? Uh, gang planks. 
uh, brailing the buckets, the ship's tools, the anchors, the chains, like lead weights. Uh, I mean, and then we had to think about the infrastructure, the, the ship sheds, the warehouses, the arsenals. Then we got to think about the men. I mean, it's just it, to, to run a Navy in antiquity is just like running a Navy almost, almost not the same, but almost like running um, a modern Navy, right? It's, it's a major expenditure. Right? We think about the, the modern U.S. Navy. It costs a lot of, of money to keep the U.S. Navy afloat. And in antiquity, it costs a lot of money to run uh, a Navy. I mean, the Athenians spend a lot of money to maintain their ships and keep them in order and keep them running constantly, constantly, constantly. And so do, so do the, um, so do the uh, Hellenistic rulers and so do the Romans. A lot of people are like, oh, the Romans, you know, they... They don't like maintaining a navy, and it's because it's so expensive. <laughs> so I, w- I would say that overall, rams uh, do cro- cost, you know, probably more than we would like to think they are, but uh, not as not as much. <laughs> it is what it is. No, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I would uh, I'd be curious to see how long it takes them to actually make something like that. My plan is uh, I'm trying to get a little. I have like a small a small team together. And my plan is this summer to build a false bow and go through the processes of actually casting um, a trireme sized naval ram. So we'll see how it goes. I would recommend you video parts of that. Oh, no. We're, yeah, we're, no, we're, we're recording. We're going to record everything, the whole entire thing, because it's, it's, that's a major deal. I mean, that hasn't been done in 2000 plus years. So yeah, that's, that's a huge thing, man. Don't forget to check out the links in the video description below. It's going to take you to some awesome references and sources where you can learn more, but also it's going to take you to our guest himself to where you can support all of the awesome work he is doing to not only make history matter, but to better educate people like me and you on the subjects that we all love. And so once again, decession. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you again. Oh.